All right. Okay, so we have a pleasure to hear again a wonderful lecture from Jean-Luc. Actually, Jean-Luc, it would be interesting to just uh, to say two words, your path, because I forgot. The first lecture of the students, some, somehow they like to know how you got to do what you do, you know, what kind of background, if you can just spend two words. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, I did my PhD in Texas, in Austin, in physics, and uh, in plasma physics, but with a kind of strong specialization in Hamiltonian, uh, you know, field theory, basically, infinite dimensional Hamiltonian systems. And then I did a postdoc in, at Columbia with a plasma physicist, kind of doing, studying the interface of uh, fluids and plasmas. And that's what made me kind of transition a bit more into the fluid dynamics world. And uh, after graduating, um, I had trouble in the US, you know, the physics community, the physics departments, they don't do much fluid dynamics in the United States. And so I was luckier to find a job in England. So I ended up at Imperial College in the math department um, as my first faculty job. And so that's really what transformed me into a mathematician. You know, it's, I didn't change what I did all that much, but on paper, I went from being at a, at a uh, physics department to being in a math department, which also meant that I, when I decided to move back to the US, now math departments would consider me, right? Whereas before, um, bef before that, it was, you know, math departments find it harder to look at physicists and things like that uh, as potential hires. But if you come from a math department, then by now people had forgotten what my PhD was in, in some sense. So I, I think career-wise, I've drifted steadily kind of more mathematical, I think, over time. And so because I was interested in mixing, I was naturally led in the early 2000s by looking at these papers on fluid dynamics of mixing, and in particular, these topological approaches. And so it took a long time to kind of teach myself all of these topological tools, starting from really nothing. Um, but, you know, in the end, it was very rewarding. Right? I'm glad that I learned all this stuff. It's nice also because it's a fairly unique skill set in fluid dynamics. Not many people know these topological dynamics sorts of tools. Um, so yeah, so it's, for me, it's proven very useful. So uh, I'm not sure if that's the kind of thing you wanted, but yeah, yeah, perfect. The kind of thing you've perfect. got. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> okay. So um, right. So yesterday we talked about. Well, I, I showed you pictures of these mixing devices and these taffy pullers that somehow achieve this exponential folding of curves. Um, and exponential is good. And maybe I didn't quite say it, but one reason why exponential is good is because if you have two fluids, then the interface, if you have two fluids that can react to each other in some chemical engineering application, then the interface between those fluids is a curve in 2D at least. And so the rate of growth in the, of that curve is exactly the, the intermaterial contact area between the two reacting fluids. So for increasing reaction rates, it is important to kind of make this interface grow as rapidly as possible. And if you can get it to grow exponentially, then that's the, pretty much the best you can do. And what I then introduced was the idea of mappings of a surface to itself, homeomorphisms and diffeomorphisms, and then curves on those surfaces. So closed curves in particular, what we call loops, are an important object of study on surfaces, and in particular, the fundamental group of a surface is in some sense the space of loops on that surface, up to, up to equivalence, up to homotopy. And then we started treating the most, the simplest possible surface from the point of view of topology is the, the torus. So periodic boundary conditions, and we use as the torus a model where it's just a square, And then we were naturally think of closed curves on the torus. So for instance, a closed curve could be something like this. Notice that it's closed because it starts and ends at the corner and the corner is all the same point, right? If you identify periodic boundary conditions, there's only one point on the corner. And so this would be our base point X zero for our, the elements of our fundamental group. And this particular loop we would denote as two ones, right? Uh, one, two, because it goes twice, you know, it wraps twice around the vertical direction for only once around the horizontal direction. 
And these are oriented loops, so this is possible. But if you reverse both signs, you get you get well. If you if you reverse both signs, you actually essentially get um yeah you you get the the reverse loop right the opposite direction. Okay. So then we started looking. How do you classify mappings of the torus to itself, homeomorphisms or diffeomorphisms of the mapping to, of the torus to itself, up to uh, homotopy again, so equivalent or isotopy, right? As I have defined. Um, in particular, I tried to convince you that what you really want to do is to look at the action of a map on closed curves. So, and we eventually concluded that the action induced by some diffeomorphism phi of the torus to itself, the action of that mapping on the fundamental group of the surface. So on pi one, the pi one is the fundamental group of the torus. It's the space of the loops based at x zero that the mapping could be expressed as a two by two matrix because if any element of pi one can be expressed as a two vector. So then we said, well, let's write down the most general matrix that we can. Of course, it's not totally general because it has to be an element of SO2 or SO2Z. So it's two by two matrices with integer entries and unit determinant. And I explained last time where that all came from. The fact that it's got unit determinant is because of, it needs to be invertible, but it's inverse also needs to contain only integers because its inverse is also a diffeomorphism because of the definition. Of, the inverse of phi is also a diffeomorphism. The next step was to look at the characteristic polynomial of this two by two matrix, which looks like this, where tau is the trace of the matrix and one is the determinant of the matrix. This has eigenvalues x plus or minus. So tau plus or minus tau squared minus four. And this tau squared minus four square root suggests that something interesting happens when tau is equal to two in absolute value. So at the very end of the last lecture, we considered the three possible cases where the trace of the matrix is less than two. So that means it can only be minus one, zero, or one. And in all three cases, we concluded that some power of the matrix is, was the identity map. Okay. In particular, you can pick 12 as the lowest sort of common multiplier that guarantees that some power of the matrix is going to be the identity. So for tau less than two, every single matrix is so-called finite order or elliptic, meaning that after a certain number of powers of phi, you get back where you started. And I want to emphasize again that it's important to know that this is topologically, this is a topological claim up to homotopy or up to isotopy of maps. Um, because it doesn't mean that phi to the 12 is the identity. It means that phi to the 12 is homotopic or isotopic to the identity, meaning you can, whatever image you get of the surface under that map, you can retract it, you can deform it back to be the identity map, which is the best we can do unless we specify more information. It's the best we can say in the, in the topological set. Okay. So where we're picking up now is to consider the, the other cases. And clearly the next case is tau is equal to two. Or tau is equal to plus or minus two, right? So there's only two possibilities when tau is equal to two and the trace of the matrix, which again, tau is just a plus d. So if tau is equal to two, notice that my eigenvalues are uh, tau over two. We have a degenerate pair of eigenvalues, right? And um, we can use the Cayley-Hamilton theorem again. Remember, our, th our Cayley-Hamilton theorem says that m squared is equal to tau m plus i. Okay. Um, so if tau is equal to two, then we can rewrite. Um, let's see. Um, we can rewrite this as a square, right? If this is plus or minus two, then notice that I can bring everything to one side and write this as M minus plus I squared is equal to zero. So again, M minus plus I all squared is equal to zero. 
So this is interesting. It's a, this is a matrix on the left, and it's squared is zero. It doesn't mean that the matrix is zero. It just means that this is equal to a matrix that I'll call N, which is no potent. Or I'm sorry, I guess it's item potent. No potent, right? It's item potent. The squared is equal to zero. Okay. So no, nil potent. N squared is equal to N is item potent. Sorry. Um, right. So in other words, we can write M going back here to say that um, M minus plus I is equal to N. So this is. So the matrix M is some plus or minus identity plus a nil potent block. Okay. So this is not the same as finite order because you can keep taking powers on M and you will not get back to where you started. Again, as I said last lecture, the whole idea of dynamics is to keep doing the same thing over and over again. And for us, it's acting with the matrix M over and over again. So something fairly simple will happen when we take powers of M, but you'll never actually get back to where you started. So for instance, what's an example of a nil potent matrix? Well, you could imagine taking zero B, zero, zero. That's a matrix whose squared is zero. Right? If, you have no, if you have an upper triangular matrix in two dimensions, or in, in, then it's squared is zero. It has zeros on the back. So the matrix M, for instance, could look like this. Right? It could look like plus or minus one, B, zero, plus or minus one. So that is a matrix whose, um, who sat that satisfies all of our requirements. Its determinant is one. And it's not that the squared of N is identity, right? If, if you keep taking N squares, you can work out that you'll get, let me just take plus one for simplicity. I think you get uh, B plus one here, right? If you square B, you are basically adding, if you square M, sorry. Jean plus one. We are at the limit of uh, Oh, the sorry, should I need to? <laughs> but I zoomed it out enough, thank you. Let me just no. check my image. That better? Okay. Are you still there? Yes, yes. We're okay, here. good. I was worried that I screwed something up by <laughs> touching the remote control. All right. So M squared is B plus one. And in fact, M to the N would be B plus N plus one or something, right? Um, B plus N minus one. So you're incrementing one entry of this matrix each time. So let's just draw a picture of how that thing acts in practice on our torus. So for simplicity, let's take M to be um, one minus one, zero, one. I might have screwed this up. I don't know. Maybe I didn't. So then M squared, let, let's consider M acting on an element like um, one zero. So what's M times one zero? Well, it's going to be, uh, sorry, zero one. M acting on zero one will be, let's see, minus one, one, right? And then M squared acting on zero one. Let's see, you, you now take um, one times minus one, so that's minus two. One. You can maybe see the pattern, M cubed acting on zero one is equal to minus three, one. So what does that mean as, as far as our loop is concerned? Well, it means that we're winding the loop ever more tightly across one direction of the torus. So if I start with my model for the torus as a square, and I think of zero, one as my loop, that's a vertical loop like this. 
Okay. So that's, let's call this X. That's X. So then if I do M squared on that loop, I will get something like that, something that goes in minus one in the horizontal direction, but plus one in the vertical, in the horizontal direction. So something like this, I guess. Right. I should draw this in yellow just to agree with my previous picture. So that's minus one, one. Zero, one. And then the next image is minus two, one. That's something that winds twice in X, but only once in Y. And so if you draw it, you can see that it's going to be something like this. So that's minus two. So you can kind of see the pattern. What I'm doing is I'm twisting the loop. The loop is wrapping more and more times around one direction of the torus while leaving the winding you know, around the other direction fixed at equal to one. So those are very special elements. They're called parabolic ele elements, just like the other one was called an elliptic element. This is a kind of boundary case. So this sort of element is called a parabolic element of the mapping class group. Parabolic elements will have the following feature. First of all, they're not finite order, which means that if you keep taking a power, you don't get back to the identity, but you also don't get exponential growth. So if you satisfy both of these requirements, you're essentially in the class of so-called parabolic elements. And in fact, there's some of the elementary ones are called vein twists. So for instance, the one I drew over there and another one, these two triangular elements are called fundamental Dane twists. And you can see this is the upper triangular. I put a minus one there. That's just a convention thing that doesn't really do anything. And then the other one is the lower triangular version. Okay. And the reason why these are important is that together, they generate all of SO2Z. In other words, any two by two matrix with unit determinant can be written as some product of these two matrices and their inverse. It might be a long sequence, but every single element of SO2 can be written as some product of these. And that'll turn out to be important later when we talk about the break group. Okay, just, just to look ahead a little bit, these matrices will be identical to the action of braids on the disk. It will, it will be related to the action of a braid on the, the, the pins of our taffy pullers that we saw in the first, at the beginning of the first lecture. Okay. Let me just make sure that I haven't forgotten to say anything. Right. We're good. Okay. Any questions before I move on to the third and final case? Uh, may I ask you something, Professor Stifo? Uh, I'm sorry, but the third um, example I didn't understand quite well. Why is it the two lines, the, the line going vertically like two times on the y-axis and not and just once in the x-axis and not the opposite, like going twice in the x direction and once in the y direction? I kind of lost. Uh, it. it could be that I got it. It could be that I got it wrong. I think I might. Did I get it wrong? I always get that picture confused in my head. <laughs> um, so if you think of this as the x-axis, yes, this is indeed wrapping twice, right? Does that make sense? Because um, I I understood that it's going twice in the y-axis, but okay, if you. If you say so, like I, if you, I, if you I, imagine I, following the loop in this direction, right, okay, it goes or the x direction is like this direction, right? Yeah, okay, so it goes down, back up, and then back down. Ah, okay, so it's wrapped twice in the x direction, in the x direction. Okay, okay, yeah. now I got it. You know, Sorry. to be honest, it's just a conventional thing, like in the sense that you could probably make sense of it either way, but that's <laughs> that's the current interpretation that I'm using. Hopefully, I didn't get it backwards. I, I tend to get confused about these things very easily. 
No, but I, I understood. Sorry, <laughs> I apologize. I, I, it could be that I did it backwards, to be honest, from my notes. I find it very hard to con convince myself one way or the other. I always get confused. <laughs> I always have to look it up. But, you know, let's just take it as morally speaking, that's kind of what's happening. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Okay. Okay, oops. So what about the final case? The final case is any trace of the matrix, which is bigger than two. Then what happens is that the two roots, X plus or minus, that I wrote before, which are equal to half tau plus or minus root of tau squared minus four, those are now two real numbers, okay? Um, right, because if, well, it was two distinct real numbers, right? For tau less than two, this was an imaginary number, but we use the Kelly-Hamilton theorem to avoid, to, talk, to avoid talking about complex eigenvalues. For tau is equal to two, then it's real eigenvalues, but it's a degenerate pair. For tau bigger than two, you have two distinct real eigenvalues. So that means that now it kind of makes sense for us to start thinking about diagonalizing the matrix, perhaps. Again, we could have done this in the complex case, but it's easier not to do that. So let me define a number lambda to be the kind of biggest one of these eigenvalues in magnitude. So it's actually going to be absolute value of tau plus root of tau squared minus four. Because it could be that tau is minus 20, right? In which case the biggest eigenvalue in magnitude is the negative. Um, so this number is going to be called a dilatation or the dilation or the growth or the expansion factor or the stretch factor. It has many, many different names in the literature and the concept of Anasov maps. Um, so, the two eigenvalues, in other words, are equal to um, plus or minus lambda and lambda inverse. Because of the unit determinant, the product of the two eigenvalues is always equal to one. So either both eigenvalues are positive or both eigenvalues are negative. Okay? So the plus or minus here is the sine of tau, the S-I-G-N of tau. Okay? But lambda itself is always defined to be positive. In fact, you can even see that this is bigger than one, right? Because tau is bigger than two, this thing is bigger than one. Because, you know, as you limit tau to two, this is one, but then you're adding something non-zero to it. So this is strictly bigger than one. So what kind of number is, is lambda? Well, it won't surprise you that this is an irrational number, right? Well, actually, you might worry that maybe for some values of tau, this could be a, you know, th this radical might not be an irrational number, but in fact, this never happens. If you take a squared minus four, you never get, um, you, ne you never get something that's rational again. You can show this, actually, it's an interesting little exercise. One way to show this is to compute the continued fraction expansion of lambda, which you can easily do by using the characteristic polynomial itself. Because if you think of the characteristic polynomial, If you multiply it by x inverse, it tells you that x is tau minus x inverse, right? So I just solve the characteristic polynomial, and then I can use this to actually generate the continued fraction representation of lambda. So I can show that lambda in continued fraction representation is tau minus one plus, um, one over tau minus two plus one over tau minus two. Um, something like this. 
But you can easily show that the continued Frankian representation uh, is, it, it never ends, right? It is periodic actually, but it never ends, which is the hallmark of a, an irrational, um, but algebraic number, right? The fact that this, this sequence of numbers here is, is periodic, it repeats itself, but it never ends. So tau, so, so lambda is an irrational number, which is not very surprising. Um, what that means is that if I compute the eigenvector of the matrix, so remember we have our matrix M, and the two eigenvectors can be written plus or minus lambda minus D, C, and plus or minus lambda inverse minus D, C. That's one way to write the two eigenvectors. Um, and one of them will be associated with the with lamb, with you know plus lambda say and minus lambda inverse in the case of tau positive. What's important here is that the lambda shows up in the eigenvectors along with the integers, but that does, that does tell you that the slope of the eigenvectors is irrational. So if I draw, the question is, what is the loop associated with this? Shall shall, shall look yeah. one sec. One second, because yep. I, uh, I didn't, can you make it a little bit bigger the, when you write the eigenvector, I can see. Sure, um, it's not, yeah, uh, let me just. It, appear, it appears very small. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, it's not the best audio visual setup. The one eigenvector is plus or minus lambda minus T and then C. And the other one is just replacing lambda by lambda inverse. Okay. Is it reasonable now? Can you sort of yes, see? yes, 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 yes. Okay. So again, my point is that this lambda here means that the the slope of the eigenvector, the direction that it defines in the plane, is an irrational number. Which means that if you try to draw it as a loop, right? Let's say you try to say, well, this is going to be some kind of loop. You know, you, you, you can't do it. It is not in the space of loops because it doesn't have, you can't multiply by some common denominator to turn it to something involving two integers. What it is, is a funny curve that just keeps going. I'm trying to draw it in an honest way, but you get my idea that this thing keeps wrapping around the torus, but it's never going to bite its own tail because if it did, it would be a rational number, right? If there was some multiple of number of times going this way, number of times going this way, that you came back to your tail, that would have the implication that this entry here is a rational number. And we already know that lambda is an irras irrational number. So um, this means that this eigenvector is not in the class of loops. And so therefore we can't really diagonalize our matrix in the way that we were hoping with. We can't really pick some representation where we're, we're, we're picking a basis for the loops in some sense, right? This is not a legitimate basis to transform into for the space of, of loops. But dynamically what's happening, if you remember what happens to a matrix, when you take a large power of a matrix, acting on some vector, the, for, in the limit as n goes to infinity, what happens is that this will align with the um, eigenvector associated with the largest eigenvalue. So let's call this u here. u is the unstable eigenvector. So it's the eigenvector associated with the eigenvalue that has with the eigenvector as eigenvalue lambda, where lambda is the, the, the largest of the two eigenvalues. So roughly speaking, that means that this will go as lambda to the n times u, right? In the sense that if I start with any initial loop x, which is a vector of integers, but I take the limit of very large n, then asymptotically, the image of m to the n times x will be dominated by the largest eigenvector. Right, because the other part is plus lambda to the minus n times s, where s is the stable eigenvector. So that will go to zero as n goes to infinity. 
So what that's saying is that the, this loop might not be a true loop, but any initial condition will, tr will, will try to align with this unstable direction. So a real loop will be something that is actually closed, right? But somehow comes quite, quite close to the actual eigenvector. But the difference is it eventually does close. I mean, it's, pretty, it's obvious what this is. This is a rational approximation to an irrational number. And you all know that you can approximate an irrational number as, as well as you want to an irrational one by just taking a bigger and bigger denominator, right? By allowing yourself to use bigger and bigger uh, rational numbers. However, note that the length of this loop will actually grow exponentially at the rate lambda to the n. So this is why lambda is the most important quantity in all of this. I told you that lambda was bigger than one, again, because of its definition, because tau is bigger than two, right? So this is bigger than one, and then you're adding something bigger than zero. So you're getting something bigger than one. Okay. So we conclude that for this class of mappings with trace bigger than two, these are called the hyperbolic elements. And for the hyperbolic elements, if you repeatedly act on some initial loop, no matter what the loop is, it will eventually grow exponentially. Well, not even eventually, it will immediately grow exponentially in this case. Well, in some cases, it might have a transient. It could shrink on the very first iteration, but then keep growing. Notice that there's no loop that can be fixed by this, right? Because if there was a loop that did not grow, then it would be an eigenvector of this matrix. And we already know all the eigenvectors. There's one that grows and one that decays. So there cannot be any kind of fixed loops under the action of the snap. All loops will eventually grow. And it's not possible to have a loop that only shrinks because S, the stable eigenvector, is also irrational. So there's no way to exactly represent a loop, to use, to use a loop to exactly represent S. You might approximate it very well, but you'll eventually have to grow away from it. Another interesting observation is that M inverse will reverse the role of U and S. If I, if I act backwards with my map, then because the, the, um, the eigenvalues of M inverse are just lambda and lambda inverse swapped, so they're the same thing again, and U and S are also swapped. So this is the important observation that if you iterate backwards in time, so if you pick a minus N direction, then your loop will, will align with the complementary stable direction, which is not necessarily perpendicular to you. It is if M is a symmetric matrix, but in general, M is. Okay, so that was a lot of information at once, but maybe let me pause and ask if there's any questions about clarifications. Okay. So, the simplest example is very famous. And if you've taken any kind of dynamical systems course, you perhaps saw this very famous map, which is called Arnold's cat map, which just consists of the entries 2, 1, 1, 1. You might think that there would be a way to, make, to do something even simpler by having some zeros. But having zeros is actually quite difficult, right? Because if I put a zero here, notice that the determinant of the matrix has to be one. So if I make a zero here, then the determinant is just the product of these two numbers. And if you want that product to be one, then you can't have the trace being, um, um, the trace will have, exactly, will have to be exactly equal to two, okay? So it's not possible to do this by putting a zero on the off diagonal. And therefore the, the Arnold cat map is about the simplest thing you can do to have a matrix whose trace is bigger than two, but whose determinant is actually equal to one, right? Because two times one minus one times one is zero. And famously in that case, the dilatation, so the largest eigenvalue is equal to one half 
3 plus square root of 5, which is the square. Oh, uh, oh uh, Jean Luc, there is a question. Yeah, just a sec. Yes. So 3 plus root 1 half of 3 plus root 5 is actually exactly the square of 1 half of 1 plus root 5, which is the golden ratio of square roots. All right, it's five. So the Arnold cat map is a sort of very distinguished object with a dilatation or an expansion constant or a growth, its largest eigenvalue equal to exactly the golden ratio of the square. Okay, uh, question, yeah. So uh, Victor is asking, would you mind re-explaining the stability of the eigenvector? You know which one is stable or not? The, the value of its associated lambda? Yes, exactly. So that's just a just just a, a definition, right? There's a lambda bigger than one, and there's a lambda, there's a there's two eigenvalues, right? X plus and minus. And lambda is the magnitude of the largest. Okay. So I will take the one with the largest magnitude, and I will call that one the unstable direction. And then I will take the one with the smaller magnitude. And we'll call this one the stable direction. And the distinguishing feature is one has an eigenvalue which is bigger than one in absolute value, and the other one has an eigenvalue which is less than one in absolute value. And the reason why I know that that has to be the case is because the product of the eigenvalues has to be one, because this matrix has the determinant the one. So there's always going to be a direction which is unstable, and there's always going to be a direction which is stable. And the distinguishing feature is whether the eigenvalue is bigger than one or less than one. Does that make sense? Yeah, we're happy. <laughs> okay, good. Sorry, I can't look. My laptop is way over there. Sorry, I don't really see what's happening on the laptop. Okay. Okay, so the point is you approach, you approach this, this, uh, this uh, stable direction, but it, which has an irrational slope. So again, just to foreshadow a little bit, we're actually very close to the taffy puller in some sense, or to the or to the mixing device that I showed. Maybe I should show another the movie again, just because I think uh, I, uh, you know you will incrementally understand better and better what it means to see that movie. So let me show you again. That's the sec is there. Okay. So this is the movie that I showed yesterday of the, of the mixing device with the rods moving. And again, I mean, you're not yet in a position to know what I'm, to, to understand the details of this, but I will tell you that this curve that you see there is very analogous to one of our loops. It would be, it would be exactly a loop if it, if it was actually wrapped around the rods, but it isn't. But what I want you to focus on is the fact that it's approaching a fixed pattern, right? If you look, it does seem to be kind of converging to some, you know, canonical platonic pattern underlying the whole thing of streaks. That pattern is exactly the same object as my unstable direction, as my unstable eigenvector. And just like for the torus case, my, my mixing pattern here is trying to approach this, which has infinitely fine structure, but it will never quite get there, right? Unless, of course, there's diffusion and other effects, et cetera. But mathematically, it is trying to align with this direction in some sense. The difference, of course, is that for the mixing device, we're not on the torus and things are a little bit more subtle, right? In the sense that it's not just a question of looking at the linear action on the map, but I'll try to convince you by the end of this lecture, maybe that they're kind of the same thing. You can see the board again, right? Yes, you can see it? Yes. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? <laughs> 
So now I would like to explain this relationship between the torus and the space of our taffy puller in some sense, of our mixing device that we just saw. So let's go back to our model of the torus. Okay, so this is our torus, and I'm gonna be more, a bit more specific. We actually have axes, right? We have zero, one, zero, one, and since this is actually a section, a periodic section of the xy plane. Okay, and let me define, what I would like to do now is to go from the torus to the space where my, my mixing device is gonna live, which is a punctured disc, a disc with some special points that are, that as you saw in the, in the, in the video, these points are kind of moving around. Okay. So how do I how do I make a construction where I go from this torus space to this disk? And it turns out that the important object is a little map called iota, right? The Greek letter iota or iota, um, which is a map from the torus to itself. And iota is going to be the simplest map you can imagine. Iota of x is minus x. That's all. Okay. Iota just kind of takes my torus and, well, what, what do I mean when I say minus x, right? That's a bit of a tricky thing because I'm, my torus lives between 0 and 0, uh, 0, 1 and 0, 1. So I have to tell you that this is mod 1, right? So I take modulo an integer in every direction. I only keep the I only keep the positive fractional part of this. Okay. So I'm not telling you yet why this map is interesting, right? Minus the identity, but let's just study it a little bit. I claim that it has four fixed points. Anybody see what the fixed points of this map, this map are? I mean, there's one trivial fixed point, right? Zero, right? If I say iota of zero is gonna be minus zero. So the origin is a fixed point. Of the map iota. Fine. But I claim that there's actually several other fixed points. For instance, consider the point one half and zero. Okay, what is iota of one half and zero? Well, remember iota is just minus the vector. So it's minus a half zero. But I have to take mod one. In other words, I have to add any multiple of an integer that I want to make sure that the answer is in the unit square. Is from zero on to zero one. So notice that the only way to get minus a half to be back within zero one is to add one. So if I add one to one half, I get one. to minus a half, I get a half. So I can update my picture here, say that one half zero is actually a fixed. So now maybe you can see where the other fixed points are going to be because the same thing happens for zero, one half. And finally, one half, one half, right? If I just take the center point, it also gets mapped to itself. So the map iota has four distinguished points. Distinguish fixed points. Okay. So far, so good. Please interrupt if there's any ambiguity. Okay. So these four fixed points are going to play an important role. We'll give them some names. Um, we'll call this one zero, 
um, and then one, and then two, and then three. So in particular, I call them P0, P1, P2, and P3. That's just defined counterclockwise. Okay. Right. So let me now construct what's called a quotient space. Call a new surface S, and S is going to be our torus modulo iota, or quotient, sorry, quotient iota. What does that mean? If you've seen this concept of quotient spaces, what it's saying essentially is that my space will still be the torus, but if there are pieces of the torus that are related by iota, then those only count as one point. So I'll give you an example. Iota maps, say, this point to this point. Right? Because, again, you, you do minus this point, but then you do mod a half, and you get back to this one. So as far as Iota is concerned, these are exactly the same point. So how do we draw this surface? I'm going to make a very big picture. Try to do this. We have four distinguished fixed points. But let's try to think of what happens to the lines in between those fixed points. So, for instance, if I draw this curve and I give it a little arrow, where is this curved map under the action of iota? Well, this little, the thing to do is to look at you know, individual points. These are fixed points. So those don't move. And then if I consider this little tail point here, it gets mapped to this tail point here. So I can draw my arrow. So under the action of iota, this little segment here gets kind of reversed and now points this way. Okay. By the way, iota might be, I just said it reversed a curve, but it's still oriented. It's an orientation preserving map because it does two reversals, right? It's, it's matrix representation as an element of pi one is minus one, minus one. So the determinant is still positive one. So it's still an, an orientation preserving um, curve. In other words, it maps a little system of axes to another system of axes, which is still right-handed. So it's orientation preserved. So let's keep going. As you can imagine, it also maps this segment to this segment. Okay. Does that make sense? So now I like to represent, in fact, what it does to the interior by using letters. And you've got your, you've got my notes, perhaps you've got access to them. But let's say there's a big A drawn here. Then iota is going to map it to this quadrant. But because it also does a minus sign, it's going to flip the whole letter. And so it's going to map the A to sort of an upside down A. Okay. And it's going to map a B here to an upside down B. It's really a rotated B, right? So notice that there's now two copies of the same thing, right? This whole upper part is just duplicating the lower part because they're identified by iota. So that means that my surface S, my quotient surface, and it can be identified with only half of the space if I want, right? Again, I, I'm sort of, you know, I'm identifying points of the space which are related by iota. And therefore, once I figured out which points are related by iota, I only need one copy of these points. So all of the points above, I could choose to throw away this or throw away that. That would be exactly the same surface. I can cut my surface in many different ways, but I'll choose to cut it by deleting the top half. And what is left is the surface. Okay. 
So that's a construction of this quotient surface. Now, what surface is it, right? What is it that we have created for ourselves by doing this identification? Well, let's keep going a little bit and draw more arrows. Notice that under iota, this bit would get mapped to this bit. This is not periodic anymore because we've chopped away the upper half. So there's no reason why this is identified with this. But the sides are still identified. Uh, I need more. There we go. The sides of my surface are still the same because that's still periodic, right? I haven't chopped in that direction. So now what kind of surface is this? Well, I'm gonna start destroying these identified edges. I'm gonna start undoing them, if you will. This is, think of this as a flattened thing, right? I've pushed it onto the plane. It's also called a flat surface sometimes in the literature. So I can unflatten it, if you will. Notice that the fact that this arrow is identified with this arrow anchored at this point, means that I can kind of zip, right? I can, take my, I can take my two curves here and I can start identifying them together like this, right? So I can start zipping as I go along and I will eventually get to this picture. Which will look like this. Again, there's a little arrow point to the right here, point to the left here. I have now glued them together into one downgoing arrow, and I've glued together my two upper arrows here, my two double arrows, into one upgoing arrow. Okay, and I still have my big arrows on the sides. Okay, so I'm deforming as I go along because there's no real, you know, it's topology. I don't really need to preserve the metric. Right, my distinguished points at the ends are still there. So my four distinguished points are still here. My, my fixed points of the, of the map Iota. Okay. If you want, I can also write down my A and B. My A is here and my B is here, right? Except now I've deformed them a bit because I'm starting to zip things up. So I'm almost done, but notice that this edge is still identified with this edge. So I want to zip those two together. But the only way I can do that is by lifting the whole thing off the blackboard and gluing them behind. And so I think you can maybe see that what we're getting is actually a sphere. Surprisingly, right? By doing this iota identification on the torus, the topology of the remaining of the resulting surface is actually a sphere. I can zip behind this thing and I'll get something shaped a little bit like an American football, right? It'll be, it'll be glued behind and the whole thing will be kind of a long elongated thing. But of course, an, a football is basically a soccer ball. So in other words, a American football is basically a rest of the world football topologically. And so let me draw the final surface and we get all of it out of this. It'll be a sphere with four distinguished points, which again, we call zero, one, two, three. This circle is meant to be a sphere. I guess I can draw maybe an equator or something. From the size that it's a sphere, that's not a very good equator, but roughly speaking, that's what's happening. And let me just write down P0, P1. So I still have my double arrow so this is still zero, one, two, three. And so from three to two, I have an arrow going this way. So topologically, the surface S that I have created with this um, map Iota, and Iota is called an involution because it squares actually the identity. So it's an involution map. Um, the surface that I've created 
is now a sphere, but it's a sphere with four funny points, which don't really play a role just yet. But spoiler alert, they're actually going to be the rods of my mixing device. Those special points are actually, you know, when, when you saw the movie earlier, those are going to play the roles of the rods in that movie. Any, any questions so far just about the construction? There's pictures in my notes. I don't know if that'll help. Fine. That is fine. May I uh, ask a question? Sure. Uh, 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 professor, in your, in your simulation, there was three rods. Ah, uh, very good point. Yeah. Well, first of all, I can ignore a point if I want to. Right. So it might just be that I don't care, but also I'm going to actually give it a special role. Um, that's a very good question. The answer to your question is that the, 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 the zero point, right? I can think of sending it to infinity in some sense, in a following way. Let me take my zero point, but instead of thinking of it as a point, let me open it up a bit. Let me make it a disk. Let me leave the other three points alone, but let me just take the zero point and inflate it a little bit. But then I can keep inflating it until I actually get a disk instead of a sphere, where the boundary of the disk is the zero point and my three points live like this. Okay, so the zero point in the simulations is actually just the boundary of the disk. It's still there, but it's kind of surprising, right? A boundary and a point are not so different. If you allow yourself to cut the boundary a little bit, and then you realize that this is topology, so the size of things doesn't matter. I can stretch it as big as I want. And so again, think of this sphere as being rubber, and I make a little hole in the sphere, and then I stretch the hole out, and I step on the whole thing so that it's flattened on the ground. So now what was a hole has become the outer boundary of my rubber ball. And there are three points left over. Okay. Does that make sense? Nice. That, that also means that the boundary is fixed. Yeah? Yes, which is perfect, right? It's kind of what we need. The boundary is the one point that never moves, right? And you also notice that on the torus, using our linear maps, the point zero is the only point that never actually moves. Zero is a fixed point of every possible linear map. So it's a perfect place to put the boundary, right? Because the boundary of our disk will never move. We only want to remove the three rods. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, Thank very you. good question. Okay. So if you think about it, even if you only have three rods, right, you need that fourth point. Because imagine that I drew a loop around two of, the, two of the points. If I didn't have that zero point, I could drag my loop all around the sphere and use it to create a different loop, right? So the zero point is actually, think of it as a kind of North Pole where loops are not allowed to cross the North Pole. It's, it's preventing us from going behind the taffy puller. Like if you have a taffy pulling device, you're not allowing yourself to drag the taffy and bring it behind the whole device in order to unwind the taffy in some sense. So it's just a topological obstruction and you can think of it as the boundary of the thing. But it's actually crucial. It need, you need to have a point like that. Right, so let's think a little bit now about what happened, right, to our, our, our map Iota in terms of acting on Pi one is actually minus one, minus one, zero, zero. Okay. It just reverses the direction of my loops, but all of them therefore it preserves orientation, net orientation. But this is a very important form because there's something very special about minus the identity, right? And that is that it commutes with everything. So this is a non-trivial map, but it does commute with absolutely every two by two matrix that I can throw at it. This is important because now I would like to do the following. We have a picture where we have a torus, 
And we have a map phi from the torus to the torus. Okay, that's our original picture. But then we also have a disk, and maybe it's time that I give it a name. I mentioned this the last lecture, but this I'm gonna call D3, the disk with three punctures. Okay, so how do I make a map from D3 to D3? Well, I can use iota. Iota is my quotient with iota, I guess. Let's call it, let's call it pi. Pi is a projection map, right? Pi takes the points on the torus and projects them down to the to, to D3 using this, this uh, construction using the quotient space. Okay. And then I can do the same thing at the end. Okay. So how do I make a map from D3 to D3? Well, I need to be able to lift here and then do phi and then come back down. Okay. But an important component of this is that phi and pi always commute. So in other words, I don't affect anything by doing pi, phi, and then pi again. Because my involution commutes with the map, it means that every step this is well-defined. It doesn't matter if I act with the map on the torus first or if I act with the map on the disk first, in some sense. It doesn't matter when I do this projection, it's always well-defined. Now, there's a small problem. To go back up, you have to be a bit careful because you've got two copies of the torus here. So you're not allowed to go. You're, you're going to be, be doubling up the, the disk to get onto the torus. Right? You'll necessarily have to duplicate your disk twice to get back on the torus, which means that not everything up here can be projected down there, right? Because you, if you don't have the same thing on your two copies of your torus, then it's not legitimate. So you have to be a little bit careful about what you mean by this projection. But the important property is the commutativity of iota with every possible linear map. What it means is that every possible M that I put up here can be descended to a map of the disk. In particular, let me show you what happens to a curve and then I'll probably end there. So let's draw torus again. This is the same model as usual. And let me draw a, a loop alpha. I'll call it alpha. I chose to draw it off the axis because I want to be a little bit away from my points. So let's rem remind ourselves where our points, where our distinguished points are. Zero, one, two, three are like this. So this curve is a curve that starts between zero and three, but zero is the boundary. So let's not think of that. Let's think of it as starting between one and two. So my curve kind of initially will be between one and two. Okay. Then it needs to move along until it ends up between zero and three, but then comes back to between one and two. So between being between zero and three is like being between boundary and three. So this curve actually does this. Actually, you can't give it an orientation because because of the way the map is defined, right? Because you're really descending two copies. You, you know, you, you really have a double curve here and you're, you're laying them on top of each other because of the identification. So let's not worry about orientation in this case. So this curve here, again, here is between one and two, which is, which is here. And then it winds its way around, passes between zero and three, and then comes back between one and two. So topologically, it has exactly this shape. Whereas a vertical curve, so if I took a curve like this, and beta, it won't take you much imagination to believe that it passes between um, two and three, right? And then between zero and one. So it looks like this. 
So these two fundamental loops here, and again, I can glue them onto the punctures if you want. I'm just trying to keep them a little bit away from the punctures to make the picture clearer. When I say puncture, I mean these distinguished points, right? Um, so notice now that every curve on here, as long as it's, it's iota symmetric, right? It has to satisfy some conditions. You have to be a little bit careful, but can be descended onto a closed curve on this on the on the disc with three punctures. Okay. And that's amazing, right? Because now it means that if I have a map that causes these curves to grow exponentially under iteration. In this picture, it will look like exponential growth of these loops. And that's exactly my taffy puller. That's exactly the picture of my taffy. In fact, the taffy puller that I showed you is roughly pretty much exactly the image of the map 2111 on the torus, but descended onto this punctured disc, this, this, this with three punctures. Right. There was a there were there are some questions. Okay, I think I think this is probably a good point for me to stop. So I will I will stop and take questions. Okay, so just before I forgot, let's thank Jean Luc for the great lecture. So please join me. Open the microphone. Thank you. Thank you. So Victor doesn't have a microphone. And he was asking first, could, could you also perform this process via serographic projection with base point being the zero fixed point and then compactify the plane on which the projection was done into a disk? A stereographic projection, you said? Yes, a stereographic projection with base point being the zeros. You know, that yes. zeros. Yeah, yes. So what he's saying is you could also map the point zero to infinity, right? You could make it into the Riemann sphere, yeah. basically. Yeah. yeah. And that's totally fine. Yeah. In fact, that's the way people usually think of the Bray group in particular. They don't usually have a boundary. Uh, it's only for the physics in some sense that I think of the thing as being a boundary. But absolutely, usually think people think of this more as the Riemann sphere. Yeah, and then he has another question uh, or comment. Uh, just as, as some sort of alternative construction of D3, maybe without having to deform the fixed point into a fixed disk. No, it's just an addendum to the previous one. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Again, the disk is only for convenience, but it could be an open set, it could be a puncture, right? And then, then you would just map it to infinity. Exactly. Yeah. So that, that works just. Yeah, he's he's happy. He's happy. He okay, said, good. "Great lecture, <laughs> professor." <laughs> so, other comment? Yes, can I ask a question? Of course. course. Uh, uh, thank you, professor. Uh, so you say before the 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 dentists that are parabolic are constitute a basis for the for all the the matrices that we are working with. Yes. Um, but you say also that the the problem with the parabolic is that the the increasing is uh, say linear. Uh, the advantage of the hyperbolic is that it's exponential. But uh, can I say that uh, expressing in the basis in the basis of then twist all exponential is uh, composition of linear something like that? I, I was thinking. Indeed. Yeah, so that's a very good point. I forgot to say that. First of all, I want to apologize. I remember now, I think I wrote SO2 in some places maybe, where I really meant SL2. So I, I don't mean the group of orthogonal matrices, right? I mean, I mean the group of determinant one matrices. So if I wrote SO, SO2 somewhere, that was wrong. Um, but I can give you the example of 2111, right? So that's a hyperbolic element, we all agree. And it can be written as the product of 1, 1, I think zero one times one zero one one. So that's two one one one. So if I take the upper triangular matrix one one zero one times the lower triangular matrix one zero one one, those are two parabolic elements with trace two, but their product is a hyperbolic element with trace three. So I don't know if that's the question you were asking. In other words, the product of parabolic elements can easily give hyperbolic elements. 
Yeah, that, that was, I think it was that hyperbolic meets in an exponential rate, but so yes. parabolic, parabolic meets like in a log rate, something like that, because. Yeah, linear in this case. In this case, it ends up being linear. Yeah. Okay, okay. Right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. There's, in fact, a, a physical fluid dynamics consequence to this, right? That it's well known that to mix, there's a whole book by Rob Sturman and uh, Steve Wiggins and, uh, and uh, Julio Atino on the linked twist maps. Twist maps are maps where you do one thing in one direction and you do the other thing in the other direction. And it turns out that this is a very effective way of mixing because you cross the streamlines of the flow. And this, of course, what I'm doing here is all at the level of topology. But even in the practical level, it turns out to be a very good idea to intersect yourself. So when you're, when you're making, when you're cooking, very often you're stirring something like a paste and you find it useful to do something like a figure eight. That means that you're bisecting your previous motion. That is actually quite similar to the multiplying of these two triangular matrices. Individually, these two motions are not very good, but if you compose them together, you get a folding effect, which is really the essence of chaos. So we shouldn't be too surprised in some sense that the product of two parabolic elements is hyperbolic because that's, even intuitively, we do that in everyday life. Nice, thank you. Guys, other questions? Question? Yes? No? So, well, very nice. <laughs> Very, very, very geometrical. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the great lecture. Looking I guess forward. I'll see you on Tuesday. Yes, on Tuesday again. So, and, and if you could uh, then uh, upload and send us the link to the, for the registration since it's in, on your computer. No? Hello? Oh, oh, sorry, is it? Yeah. I think, no, it's not mine. Oh, what? for the recording? Yes. <laughs> sorry, I think you said registration, but I think you mean that, recording. Yes, recording. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll send you, I think I recorded locally, so I'll have to put it somewhere for you, but I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll give you the video. The link. Yes, we would be great. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Right. Thank good, you, uh, thank you. Week. And have a good bye -bye. day, good Thank evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.